Good morning. Good morning. Well, almost Happy New Year. I hope you all have a good weekend this weekend, and I'm looking forward to being back up with you in a couple of weeks. Let's go ahead and begin class with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and again for the opportunity to, to come and study. We ask that you'll guide us in our study, enable us to fulfill your purposes to take a true healing message to the world. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are doing lesson two in the quarterly on Psalms, and the title is Teach Us to Pray. And if we start with Sunday's lesson, the first paragraph states, a simple way of introducing the Psalms into daily life is to devote time each day to the reading of a psalm, beginning with Psalm 1 and following the order given by the Psalter. Another way is to read the psalms that correspond to your present situation, whatever it happens to be. I actually think this is a good suggestion. I've personally, and I, I suspect many of you as well, benefited from meditating on the psalms each morning. And sometimes I actually have gone through, starting at Psalms 1 and just working my way through. Other times I pick randomly. Other times I hunt for a subject matter that's uh, uh, addressing the situation I might be dealing with. Uh, some of you may recall that earlier this year, I was at a conference in April in 2023 in which uh, uh, a theologian friend, Gary Oliver, uh, was uh, doing a presentation to this Christian uh, leaders from mental health leaders from all over the country. And he was teaching them Christian meditation called Lectio Divina. And he gave the attendees a handout with a brief description of what Lectio Divina is and then instructions. And then a copy of Psalms 1, 1 through 3 from four different versions. The King James, the New Living Translation, the Message, and the Remedy of the Lord and Song, the Psalms. And and I did not know that Dr. Oliver was going to uh, speak, and I didn't know he was going to lead the group in a one-hour-long reflection of the Psalms. Uh, and I didn't know that he was going to use the paraphrase of the remedy to give with the whole group. But it just so happened that Come and Reason Ministries had a booth there, and we gave away the remedy Psalms at that event. <laughs> and so uh, people came up and, and got the remedy Psalms, and many people came up to us afterwards and told us, how much they enjoyed the remedy version compared to the other versions that were in the printout. And so I decided in the aftermath of that meeting, I would research what Lectio Divina is because I'd never heard of it before. And what I discovered is that the Latin Lectio Divina simply means divine reading. And it's an ancient Christian practice that goes all the way back to origin of Alexandria in the third, third century. And the intention of the practice is to help Christians internalize the scripture beyond mere fact or head knowledge to the deep experience and heart appreciation and practical living of the things of God. And this is what we talked about last week. We talked about the spiritual healing that the Psalms can bring. And there are four distinct aspects to this type of meditation. The first is Bible reading. So you read some aspect of scripture. And the second is meditation upon the passage that has been read, which means reflecting on what it means, thinking about, okay, what does that mean? And then the third element is prayer, talking to God about the meaning of the passage. And the fourth element is contemplation or experiential application in the inner workings of your heart and attitudes of the meaning of the scriptures that you've read. In other words, abiding in the experience of the Holy Spirit. A couple of important points about Lectio Divina. First, this form of meditation always starts with reading the scripture. If one replaces the scripture with other writings, then the meditation will serve to strengthen those writings into your being rather than God's word. The second point is that this form of meditation requires deep thinking, reflection, active thought, communication, and or prayer with God. It is not an emptying of the mind or a repetitive mantra. The goal is to expand our finite awareness, both cognitively and experientially, you might call that intellectually and spiritually, of our knowledge of God so that we know him in our whole being as Jesus Christ prayed that we would. And as we engage with God, actively connecting with him and applying his methods to our lives, we experience healing, cleansing, recreation, transformation. And as Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So God wants to heal us, sanctify us, make us holy in spirit, soul, and body. Lectio Divina meditation engages all aspects of our being. We engage our body when we disengage from the daily activities of life, put down the digital devices and sit quietly with God, often in nature, breathing in the fragrance of the flowers or hearing the songs of the birds or appreciating the rainbow or the sunshine on our skin. And in such a state of reverence, we turn our attention to the written word, focusing on the specific passage that we've chosen for that day. And then with our hearts tuned to God, we read the word and we begin contemplating the meaning. And then we talk to God about the meaning. And then we contemplate the implications of the meaning that God is leading us to understand in our being and how we can apply it to our life. Now, I had never heard the term Lectio Divina before this year. So as I researched this, it struck me that I had been doing much of this. This is exactly how I had been studying scripture. I would read, I would contemplate the meaning, I would reflect on it, I would talk to God about it, I would work on applying it. This is exactly how I'd always really pretty much studied scripture. And what I found interesting is that one of the founders of the Adventist church never used the term Lectio Divina, but described these are the core elements of healthy Bible study. Christ Object Lessons, page 50, 59, it say, states, merely to hear or read the word is not enough. He who desires to be profited by the scriptures must meditate upon the truth that has been presented to him. By earnest attention and prayerful thought, he must learn the meaning of the words of truth and drink deep of the spirit. That's the contemplation part of the Holy Oracles. So here in one passage, all the elements of the Lectio practice is described functionally in our, in our Bible study. Or another one in the Desire of Ages, page 83. It would, do, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant. Our love will be quickened and we shall more, be more deeply imbued with his spirit. It would, if we would be saved at last, we must learn the lessons of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. So regardless of what we call it, the, uh, I encourage you to take time each day apart from the busyness of life and spend some time meditating upon God's word. And I think the Psalms is a great daily devotional meditation resource for us. I found it to be true in my case. Any, anybody want to comment or, or share their experience with, with the Psalms? Well, Tim, I, I want to say that from what I've read from Ellen White's writing, she, she encourages a little bit different order of that she encourages always to always pray before you read the Bible so that your mind is already tuned in to what you're about to read and so on rather than leaving prayer till after you read it from this so so those those four were the elements mm -hmm. they were not given in an order it sounded like okay. an order when you gave it <laughs> well yeah I know it sounded that way and of course um there so the Lectio does not suggest you don't pray until until the third step. It suggests after, and Ellen White would say the same. In fact, it says it right here in the Christ Object Lessons that uh, by earnest attention and prayerful thought, he must learn the meaning of the words of Scripture. Okay? And so we're praying about what we've just read in Scripture in the Christ Object Lessons quote. So, but there's no suggestion anywhere in the Electio that you don't pray until the third step. And, and you're exactly right. Ellen White would tell us that we want to prepare our hearts and minds for the study of scripture with the prayer before. But then as we're studying the scripture, we continue in a prayerful contemplation of the scripture. And that's, that's the idea of the Electio. So I don't think it's an either or. I think you're exactly right. We want to do that. Uh, Sunday's lesson, it says in the first paragraph, all Christians know and have experienced times of despair and suffering, times when they have wondered what the Lord is doing or why the Lord is allowing these things to happen to him. The psalmists themselves went through similar things and through divine inspiration, they recorded what they had experienced. Question, if a person feels discouraged, feels down, 
feels despond so despondent that they actually wish they could die. They want to be dead. Does that mean that they are out of favor with God? No. No. Could a person be in despair even to the point that they want to die and sp still be in a saving relationship with God? Yes. Consider Elijah. Would we consider him one of the faithful who, who succeeded in life? I, I think we would. After all, he went to heaven in a fiery chariot and was called by God to encourage Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration along with Moses. Yet after Jezebel threatened to kill him, we read the following about Elijah, 1 Kings 19.4. He came to broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Was Elijah no longer in good standing with God when he said these words? Or did Elijah struggle with human emotions that discouraged him? Were Elijah's feelings of depression and despair an accurate indicator of how God felt toward him? So commenting on Elijah's experience, the author, Ellen White, the author of The Prophets and Kings, writes the following on page 162. Into the experience of all, there comes times of keen disappointment and utter discouragement. Days when sorrow is the portion. And it is hard to believe that God is still the kind benefactor of his earthborn children. Days when troubles harass the soul till death seems preferable to life. It is then that many lose their hold on God and are brought into the slavery of doubt, the bondage of unbelief. Could we at such times discern with spiritual insight the meaning of God's providences? We should see angels seeking to save us from ourselves, striving to plant our feet upon a foundation more firm than the everlasting hills, and new faith, new life would spring into the being. <laughs> Any thoughts about that passage? Beautiful. The Bible stories, like Elijah and all the rest, are not simply historical records, but they're lessons for us to show us God's dealing with people. When Elijah became discouraged by his human emotions, God did not abandon him. God did not look down on him. God did not condemn him, reject him, but God moved in love and sympathy and compassion with grace and truth to save Elijah from his own discouragement. And God works in every single person for every single person in the same way. The difference is that not every person responds to God's love, grace, truth, or their own emotions and discouragements in the same way. Some don't do as Elijah did in discouragement. Notice the text, Elijah turned to God and prayed to God. Just take my life, God. He's having a conversation. He's in prayer over his discouragement. Some, some instead turn to other behaviors that are actually harmful to them to try to numb the pain. But God is still there working to reach them, to save them from their own feelings of discouragement. I can tell you in my own life, I found this to be true. I've had moments of despair, weakness, discouragement, depressed moods, feelings of hopelessness that were tempting me to think that life would be better if God just took me to heaven and this life was over, if I just died. But at those times, I remember this story. I have remembered this, what Elijah went through. I have remembered this quotation from Prophets of Kings. And I realized that my emotions were simply tempting me, and they were not from God. And I cried out to God for deliverance to send the angels to put my feet on paths more sure. And in every single time, I was imbued with hope and encouragement. One of my, one of my favorite verses is, um, he knows our frame. He remembers that we're just dust. You know, God knows we're just dust. We're just, mm -hmm. we're not superhuman, you know, extra ability people. We're just dust. And I think he, he understands when we are not, uh, you know, at our best all the time because we're, we're creatures of dust. Exactly. And this is where we have to have that historical experience of knowing God for ourselves before we find ourselves in those moments of strong emotional discouragement so that we can differentiate between what we know to be true 
and the strong feelings we might be experiencing in, in that moment. So this is part of the journey of every person. In the, in the life of everyone comes moments like this. And the Psalms are filled with helpful songs. Consider Psalms 143. Lord, respond favorably to my prayer. Intervene mercifully, mercifully to my plea, because you are faithful always to do what is right. Come to my relief. Do not judge my, do not judge me responsible for my sin condition, for no one living can set themselves right with you. The enemy hounds me, crushing my joy crushing my joy for life into the dirt, driving me into the darkness with no zest for living like those already long dead. I'm tired of living. I'm discouraged and ready to give up. But then I remember what happened in the past. I focus upon your design and all you have done and think about your plan and all you have made. I surrender myself to you. My inmost being thirsts for your life-giving presence like dry land thirsts for rain. Respond to me quickly, O Lord, I am dying inside. Do not keep your life-giving presence from me, or I will surely die and join those in the grave. Let each day start with your love filling my heart, for I have put my trust in you. Teach me the way to live, for I surrender myself to you. Rescue me from my enemies, O Lord, for I place myself under your protection. Teach me to fulfill your purposes, for you are my God. May your spirit of truth and love lead me to the world recreated to your design. Heal me, O Lord, to magnify your character of love. Cleanse my soul from sinfulness because you, are all, you always do right. Show mercy to my enemies and let them go. Let perish all those who reject healing and persist in attacking me, for I am your faithful follower. Any thoughts about the Psalms? Very nice. Yeah. Very, Very uplifting. We find the psalmist and others in Scripture going through the same struggles, and this is what the Scriptures are there for, to show us how God deals, to show us the, the journey of the faithful, to show us that we're not alone, to encourage us and provide us the resources in our times of struggle. Tuesday's lesson points us to Psalms 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so, so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? And the lesson notes that these words are famous because Jesus quoted them on the cross. Question, what do you think Jesus' use of these words on the cross reveal? When Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did God reject Jesus at the cross? No. no. Did God become angry with Jesus, upset, mad, hostile, punishing towards Jesus at the cross? No. This was reflecting did, his human feelings. Yeah. Yeah. Did God use power to harm Jesus at the cross? No. no. What happened at the cross? God had to back off. <laughs> Why did Jesus die? What kind of death did he die? Human. Was it, necess was it a necessary for Jesus to die yes. for the plan of salvation to be accomplished? Yes. yes. What did the Father do to his son at the cross? Let, let him go. Separate himself from him. So all these questions are, 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 are vital questions, but does the law lens we hold impact how we answer them? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do we agree that the plan of salvation centers upon Jesus, his sinless life, his voluntary, sacrificial, and substitutionary death, his victory over death, and his resurrection? Do we agree that, that the plan of salvation centers on this? Yes. yes. So Jesus is the solution. The plan of salvation is God's plan to resolve the sin problem. It is the treatment to the sin problem then what we understand about the healing plan, the solution, the remedy, the treatment, the fix to the sin problem, what we understand it to, to do, to achieve, is determined by what we think the actual problem of sin is. So what is the problem that sin caused that, that Adam and Eve did to us when they sinned? What is the problem that sin caused that the plan of salvation fixes? 
And our answer to that question yeah. is determined by how we understand God's law. That's right. yeah. If we believe God's law functions like human law, made up imposed rules that require the rule giver to inflict punishment, then we falsely conclude that the sin problem is a legal problem. <laughs> and the just solution is the infliction of the just punishment and the minimum punishment is death, then we falsely conclude then the solution is Jesus, then Jesus' mission was to come to live a sinless life so that he personally did not break any of the rules and thus did not personally deserve to have the inflicted punishment of God put upon him so that God could place all of our rule-breaking and deed sins on him and do a make-believe, pretend trick, and treat the innocent Jesus as if Jesus was the one who did all the bad stuff and broke all the rules and then make a claim not actually true in reality that it is right and just to punish an innocent person for the crimes of the guilty and then teach that God used his divine power to inflict the death penalty upon Jesus so that he won't have to kill us and then we claim against all, contrary to all reality that it is just reasonable and true to declare a guilty person to be innocent if an innocent person is punished in place of the guilty. Do you think I just made this up? No. <laughs> this is pagan. It's false. It's a lie. It stems directly from believing the lie that God's law functions like human law. And it is the reason the Adventist church has failed to complete its mission to prepare the world, enlighten the world. The, the message in 1888 was rejected and this pagan thing has infected the church so that we distort the reality of what Christ has done with this pagan view. This is a quotation out of the Adventist Review, December 8, 2023. How long ago was that? December 8, 2023. So this is not something that was taught decades ago. This is active, listen to this. To spare us, God poured out his wrath against the violation of his law, sin, not on the violators of his law, sinners, but on the sinless Jesus, the only way that God could be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In short, rather than killing us for violating his law, the father killed Jesus instead. Or to put it crudely, the father killed Jesus so he wouldn't have to kill us. That's terrible. Who's the author? Yeah. Yeah. Clifford Goldstein, who's the editor of the Adult Quarterlies. And you wonder why the church is kept in darkness. Because the entire worldwide church gets a quarterly edited by somebody who's teaching a pagan view of God. Yeah. Now, let's break this down. I'm not just going to declare it. I'm going to demonstrate it to you with overwhelming evidence that this thing that's being taught is fraudulent, it's a lie, it's an obstruction to the truth. Can you find anywhere in scripture where the Bible shows God using power to harm Jesus? No. You cannot. <laughs> what you find is God stops using power and lets Jesus go to allow Jesus to experience what Jesus chose which was to be our savior, to take up the responsibility to confront Satan and quote, destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, Hebrews 2.14. Mm -hmm. Now notice what the scripture said. First off, we have no evidence in scripture anywhere that God used power to harm Jesus. We have direct evidence that God stopped using power and withdrew and abandoned and let go. We also have evidence from scripture that Satan is the one who holds the power of death. Then Christ came to destroy him who holds the power of death that is the devil. So who does scripture says hold the power of death? Satan. Right. Jesus holds the keys to life. He has the power over death and the grave. Jesus destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light, 2 Timothy 1.10. So in the quote I just cited from the review, Mm. Where does that quote, or who does that quote give the power of death to? God. Notice, 
God, they teach, holds the power of death and kills his son. They place, they worship, whoever wrote that, worships a God who wields the power of Satan. Satan holds the power of death and Christ came to destroy him. The author of that says that God killed Jesus on the cross, wielding the power of death. They have a satanic version of God. Can I say it more plainly than this? No. <laughs> this is what Paul wrote about in Thessalonians when he says that the man of sin is going to come and set himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. This is about 65 AD that Paul is writing. This is not the temple in heaven. Uh, Satan, the man of sin, doesn't rise, rise up into heaven and throw God off his throne in heaven. This is talking about the spirit temple. And that Paul says the man of sin is going to arise and he's going to dethrone God from the spirit temple and he's going to replace him and, and, and proclaim himself to be God in the spirit temple. People are going to worship a God who wields the power of death, is the source of death, who even inflicts death upon Jesus, who has to have a blood payment of a human sacrifice not to use that power of death against us. This is what is being taught in Christianity. This is what's being taught after the Adventist review. And you wonder why Christ delays his coming. And all those people go through life trying to appease God because they fear him. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is exactly right. Mm -hmm. And this is why the Adventist church was given a special message to call people at the end of time to make a right judgment about God. Be in awe of God and glorify him with the eternal good news, the eternal good news that he is the source of life, not the source of death, that he is the creator, not the destroyer, that he is the one who builds reality, whose laws are the laws upon which reality are built, him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in this, because the time in history has come for people to make a right judgment about God. The hour of his judgment has come, and people need to stop judging him to be an imperial dictator. People need to stop judging him to be like the man of sin who wields the power of death and instead begin to judge him to be our savior, our creator, the source of life. But people persistently make the wrong judgment about God if they believe the lie that God's law functions like human law. And they conclude that God is the source of death and even inflicted that death upon Jesus. They consistently judge God in the wrong light and attribute to him the characteristics of the evil one. It's when we return to design law that all this stuff is cleared up and it becomes very, very simple and straightforward. So let's break it down. What happened at the cross? Jesus completed the mission that he, the Father, and the Holy Spirit jointly carried out. For, and that mission was for Jesus to destroy death and bring life and immortality to light, 2 Timothy 1.10. To destroy him holds the power of death that is the devil, Hebrews 2.14 to reconcile all things in heaven and in earth to Christ at the cross, Colossians 1.20, to destroy the, the, the work of the devil, 1 John 3.8, and the devil has worked to destroy or efface the image of God and man and put Satan's image where God should be. And Christ destroyed that work by restoring the image of God and man to fulfill God's purpose for humanity, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Let us make man in our image. And the image of God was being destroyed by sin in humanity. And Christ restored the image of God in man, fulfilling that purpose. And to redeem Adam's fall, becoming the new head of humanity, the second Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 47 thereby restoring the species human back into perfection and unity at one meant with God. This was his mission, to reverse and heal all the damage, to erase the, the, the infection of sin from the species human. And thus it says in 2 Corinthians 5.19, now notice this, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. Notice what, who was, this is a joint effort, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This was not the Son paying a penalty to the Father to get the Father to be willing to pardon and forgive us. That's the lie of the imposed view. God was in the Son reconciling the world, fixing the brokenness, the damage of sin in us. So why did Jesus have to die? He had to die to destroy death and fear and self-centeredness from within humanity and replace it with the divine nature. Wow. 
with God's design law of perfect love. He did this when, as a human, he was tempted by human emotions to save himself in Gethsemane. But with each temptation, as a human, exercising human abilities of choice and faith in his father, he chose to give his life, surrender in perfect love, and trust himself and his life into his father's hands rather than act in self-interest. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that he lay his life down for a friend, for his friends. Jesus chose to love rather than to protect or save self. Thus, he not only demonstrated the truth about God and God's character, that's the moral influencing piece, the revelation of truth piece, revealed the truth of who God is, revealed the truth of God's character, but he also, as a, our human substitute, developed a new, sinless, perfected, mature human character, sealing humanity in its loyalty to God in the humanity he took upon himself. And this is Hebrews 5, 9. Once made perfect, he became the source of salvation for all who obey him. Once made perfect? Wasn't he always perfect? No, he was always sinless. Bible perfection is not a state of sinlessness. Adam and Eve were sinless in Eden, but they were not yet perfected and they fell. Lucifer was sinless in heaven, but he was not perfected, he fell. Jesus was sinless, but Bible perfection is about the maturity of character, being so settled into the truth intellectually and spiritually, you can never be moved from it. You have sealed your character into loyalty to God and Christ as a human being developed a perfect human character. God can create sinless beings. He cannot create character. Character is developed by the choices of the beings. And Jesus, as a human, saved the species human by total loyalty to God, eradicating the fear infection, and developing a sinless, perfect character. What was the necess necessity of his death then in the plan of salvation? It was the only means whereby God could destroy sin, not just Satan, but sin itself and the roots of sin. In order to sin, destroy sin, you have to destroy its roots. And what are its roots? The lies about God that cause beings to distrust him. He needed to destroy the infection of fear and selfishness, what is called in scripture, the carnal nature, the fleshly nature, that survival, the me first drive that we all have. And at the cross, he was tempted to come down off the cross. Save yourself and we'll believe in you. But every time the temptation came, he surrendered self in love. And thus at the cross, the desire to save self was destroyed. And he rose in a humanity purified, thereby destroying the death-causing principle and restoring the purity of God's law of love, the life-causing principle. What kind of death did he die? Did Jesus die the first death? The sleep death. Yes. Mm -hmm. My view is no. Really? Did Jesus die the second death? No. No. My view is no. <laughs> Are you talking about his humanity or his divinity? Well, his divinity didn't die. Divinity cannot die. Right. So it's only his humanity we're talking about. Okay. And you say he did not die the first death. My, my view is he did not die the first death. My view is he did not die the second death. Pardon? Rationale for the first one. Yeah. yeah please. Yeah. So before we can answer, we need to define what we what we mean by these terms, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> first death is the death in which there's only a sleep. It's the death all the righteous saints die, all the wicked die. They all die the first death. Everybody dies the first death who dies. The second death, what is the second death? We need to define that. Eternal. So the Bible only uses the term second death four times. He, and, and we're going to look at those. The first, he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. That's Revelation 2.11. This text does not tell us what it is, but only informs us that the overcomer won't be hurt by it. 
Isn't that what it says? Mm -hmm. but we don't know what it is yet, but whatever it is, the, the ones who overcome will not be hurt by it. We all agree with that so far? Mm -hmm. What about Jesus? Is he an overcomer? Yes. Mm -hmm. Then was he hurt by the second death? No. no. If this is true, that the overcomers are not hurt by it. All right. The, the next one, blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God in Christ and they will reign with him a thousand years. So this text doesn't tell us what the second death is either, only that the second death has no power over those who arise in the first resurrection. That would be those who die the first death and arise in the first resurrection, not the second resurrection, the one at the beginning of the thousand years. Well, Jesus, he didn't die at the beginning of the thousand years, did he? No. <laughs> he didn't rise at the beginning of the thousand years, did he? No. So this first resurrection isn't really talking about Jesus. It's not even talking about Moses, really. So it doesn't really tell us much about our, our question here. We haven't defined the second death yet, but we know, we know something, though, right now, that the second death... Could, won't hurt those who are righteous and therefore couldn't hurt Jesus. Yeah. What about the, the Revelation 2014? 2014 is the lake of fire is the second death. Mm -hmm. And then Revelation 21, eight, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Now this is telling us what it is. The second death is the lake of fire. Now, we'll have to unpack the meaning of that, but at this point, second death is lake of fire. Okay, let's ask some questions about Jesus. Did Jesus die in the lake of fire? No. Do we have any evidence that fire rained down from God upon Jesus at the cross or in Gethsemane, either one? No. Do we have any evidence that God used any kind of power on Jesus? No. Or do we have the opposite, that Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So we haven't fully defined what the fire is, so we haven't fully defined the second death, but what we have so far, do we have any evidence that is making us believe Jesus died the second death? No. no. Yes or no? No. no? no. These are the only Bible terms that directly mention the second death. Some Bible commentators, though, doing Bible study, add further clarification between first and second death noting that the first death is a death from which there is a resurrection, and the second death is a death from which there is no resurrection. And I think there is sound biblical conclusion to draw that conclusion. Do you all agree? Yes. Okay. If we accept that additional definitive, first death you rise from, second death you don't rise from, did Jesus die the death from which there's no resurrection? No. Or did Jesus rise again? Mm. Yeah. And in fact, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 13, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. <laughs> and so is your faith. So it's the central thing to the whole Christian faith that Jesus did rise from the dead. And if we accept the definition of the second death is a death from which there's no resurrection, then this also would, would make it an obstacle to believe or teach that Jesus died the second death. What while the Bible doesn't use second death language in other places, Jesus actually described the two deaths, though, first and second, in Matthew 10, 28, when he said, do not be afraid of the one who, kill, can, who kills the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Hell would be referring maybe to the lake of fire? What do you think? Yeah, yes. Yes. And the lake of fire, Revelation tells us, is the second death. And the second death is the one that then destroys both soul and body. What do you think? Yep. A lot of people think that refers to God. They don't think it refers to Satan as being the one who can destroy the soul and, and body. And they think that, that that verse actually is talking about God, the one who destroys the soul and body. So we haven't got to where we're working this out slowly. <laughs> Christ makes a distinction between two types of death. The first, which only the body is destroyed, and the second, in which the body and soul are destroyed. The word, the Greek word for soul is psyche, from where we get the word psychiatry and psychology, and it means your mind, your identity, your individuality. So the second death 
destroys your individuality, your, your personhood, in addition to the body. So we can make an inquiry and apply this to Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, his body ceased to living, that's true. Did his soul, his individuality, his unique personhood get destroyed, yes or no? No. no. Do we have any biblical evidence for that to be true? Everyone rec- How about in Acts 111? What do the angels say? Or what are we told? That this same Jesus who died, oh. Jesus is the same. It's the same Jesus. It's not a different Jesus. His individuality was retained. And then, of course, he appears in the upper room and says, don't you know me? Touch me. See, it's me. It's myself. Do we have evidence that it was the same Jesus? Thomas. Y'all still... Y'all still with me? Yeah. So his body died, but his individuality, his self, his soul was not destroyed. That does not meet the criteria for second death. So every indicator thus far would, we'd have to put marks by, meet second death? No, 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 no. None of the criteria for second death did Jesus meet at the cross. Lake of fire, death without resurrection, death which destroys the individuality. Jesus doesn't, Jesus' death didn't meet these. So we're making the strong case from scripture that whatever death Jesus died, it wasn't the second death. Then what was the significance of his death? First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.10. He destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light. Jesus did not die the second death. He destroyed death at the cross. Those aren't the same thing. Is dying the death the same as destroying the death? No. And he not only destroyed the death itself, he destroyed him who holds the power of death that is the devil, Hebrews 2.14. So Christ died in order to eradicate death itself. What's the last enemy to be destroyed, according to Paul in Corinthians. Death. Death. And who destroys it? Jesus. Jesus Jesus destroys death. Death does not destroy Jesus. Mm -hmm. Just let yourself cogitate on that for a moment. Now, I, I told you a moment ago, I don't believe Jesus died first death or second death. As we understand what first death is, the death of sleep, Do we agree that people like Adam, like Daniel, like Moses, and others have died first death? Yes. Does dying first death destroy death? No. No. And dying second death doesn't destroy death. Jesus' death was unique. It wasn't simply a sleep death that all people die. And it wasn't being destroyed by death, which is the second death. It was a death that destroyed the cause of death. It actually destroyed death itself. He eradicated the death-causing principle of fear and selfishness from humanity that he took upon himself and restored God's design law of love back into the human species. And you see this in Gethsemane, and you see it also at Calvary. Jesus is tempted in every way just like we are, yet without sin. And the temptation that Jesus experienced was not just external, because we aren't tempted just outside ourselves. It says in James, we're tempted, we're dragged away and enticed by our own evil desires. And in Gethsemane, Jesus experienced human emotions in such powerful anguish that he's broken to a sweat of blood. His humanity that he took upon himself is anguishing and begging him not to go to the cross. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. This is what he's feeling. But instead of giving in and choosing it, he says, but not my will, thy will be done. And no one can take my life from me, Jesus said. No one can take it. I give it freely. That is a choice of his humanity to surrender and give in love. Love in Jesus' humanity overcame fear and selfishness, destroying the death-causing principle and restoring the life-causing principle. His death was not the death 
of all the righteous who die as Stephen did, seeing heaven opened and being encouraged by the Holy Spirit and having peace in their death. He died on the cross, abandoned by his father, experienced the agony, the hiding of his father's face, because he loved us so much, he would not use power to save himself. Tim, what, and so in Christ, that article, giving this, pardon? What's that date, the exact date of that article by Clifford Goldstein? December 8, 2023. December 8? In Christ, yep. December 8. Okay. In Christ, giving destroyed taking, loving destroyed selfishness, or love destroyed t selfishness, and life destroyed death. Because Jesus was a unique being who inherited a sinful humanity from his mother, but had a spirit heart desire of holiness from his father, the Holy Spirit, in the humanity of Jesus Christ, the two antagonistic principles could ward out in his humanity. And so if you wanna get as close as we can approximate our understanding of his life journey, it would be the life journey of a convert after we're reborn with a new heart and right spirit. And then we have that internal battle between our reborn heart that desires to do good and the old nature that tempts us to do bad with the exception that Jesus never had any bad habits that he developed that we still have to overcome after our conversion but he had the ability to be tempted like us, but he had the ability to resist as a converted person does because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's the unique nature of Jesus. And at the cross, he destroyed the infection of fear and selfishness and rose in a new humanity perfected by restoring God's law of love into humanity. And this is how he could predict it because he understood that the death comes from breaking God's law the wage of sin is death. Sin, when full grown, brings forth death. And he understood that destroying the death-causing principle and restoring God's design of life and love back in would result in his rising again. And so he predicted, I'm going, I'm going to go die. In doing so, I'm going to fix the problem, and therefore I'm going to rise again. Get Tim? Yes. Um, very often people overlook what the Holy Spirit said through John the Baptist's father, Zechariah. In, in Luke 1, Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he's come and redeemed his people. He's raised up a horn, salvation for us, etc. Salvation from our enemies, from the hand of all who hate us, to show us, to show mercy to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the, land, from the hand of our enemies, and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. These are the, and so, this is the mission of, through the Holy Spirit, Zechariah laid out his, his mission goals here. And how do you see that applying to what we're talking about? I'm saying that you started off by uh, this Clifford Goldstein thing, and then we're, we're going into why Jesus, what Jesus accomplished at the cross. And whereas Clifford is saying that this is a God you should fear, <laughs> Zachariah is saying that what he did, what Jesus is aimed to accomplish, in addition to things you have also said, was to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness all of our days. And that requires eradicating the fear-driven, self-centered nature from our heart and giving us a new heart and right spirit. And that comes through what Jesus achieved for us as the second Adam at the cross. And thus, after Jesus' victory, he sends the spirit, and the spirit takes what Jesus has accomplished and reproduces it in us, so it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And this is why we are able to serve without fear, because the old man has died, and we have a new life received from Christ that he worked out in our behalf. So this idea, do you see now why I say Christ did not die the first death and he didn't die the second death? Right. 
And I have a basis for that because I see what he did was to overcome the actual infection of fear and selfishness, destroy it at the cross and rise in a perfected humanity. That's what I see him doing at the cross, something quite unique. And then the question of what about the wicked in the end? Did Jesus die on the cross the same death that the wicked in the end die? This is what many teach that Jesus did, and you will find an, a, a very aggressive and angry pushback at me from those who take the penal legal view of a punishing God when they hear that I suggest that Christ did not die the second death. They will push back angrily because if their view is right, which it's not, but under the penal legal view, the, the punishment for, death, for sin is death, and that's eternal death, and, and, and the only way to be saved is to get someone to pay the penalty. And if, if, if Jesus didn't die the second death, then their penalty is not paid, and they still have to pay it, so there's no salvation. So this idea that he didn't die the second death threatens their entire system of salvation because no one paid their penalty yet. And this is why they get very agitated by it. And, uh, but you can also do a comparison. Do a comparison between the experience of the wicked in the end and Jesus at the cross. And I'm gonna go through these with you and I want you to answer the question, are these the same experiences? Do they die for the same reasons? Did Jesus on the cross as our substitute die in the same mechanistic way and for the same reasons, experiencing the same things that the wicked in the end die experiencing? So let's look at those. Jesus on the cross died trusting his father, yes or no? Yes. That's Luke 20, and, I, and, and there should, they should pop up on the screen and there'll be a Bible text referencing every one of these points. The wicked die in the end, distrusting the father. Yes. True or false? True. Yeah. True. Is dying while you trust and dying while you distrust the same experience? No. no. Okay, next, Jesus dies longing to see his father's face. Yes. Yes. The wicked die hiding from the Father, begging the mountains to fall on them and hide them from him who sits on the throne. Christ died when the Father's presence was hidden. Right. Mm -hmm. The wicked die when the Father's presence is revealed. Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Yes. yes. Christ died less than 72 hours. The wicked die eternally. Are those the same experiences? No. And if you believe that second death is the eternal non-existence, then you should have a lot of anxiety because if you had to have that non-existence for eternity death paid, well, Jesus is in existence. He rose, that, that death penalty is not paid yet. And then they would do all kinds of tricky little things. Again, part of their whole fantasy belief system. Well, he didn't actually die the eternal death because he didn't deserve it. But on the cross, he felt like he was dying eternally. And because he felt like he wouldn't rise, then that counts. Hmm. Try that on any in any of our ju justice systems where the death penalty is in, in force. Somebody is going to the death chamber, and uh, in the death chamber, they are given the uh, lethal injection. And instead of the lethal injection, an anesthesiologist gives them uh, sleeping medicine and puts them to sleep for a day and a half, and they wake up a day and a half later. But because they thought they were going to die in that death chamber, and they had the fear of dying in the death chamber, is that the same thing as actually them dying because they were put to sleep? No, no, no. That's what they're actually saying, as if you have no brain to figure out that that's a lie. And so we have God playing tricks on Jesus and the rest of the universe. Well, I'm going to wink, wink, and just put him to sleep for a day and a half because he thought he was going to die. That's the same thing as really paying the death penalty. Wink, wink, nobody asked a question. I have a question. That's what, that's what people like Goldstein will teach. They will teach that. It's, a, another, it's another con job, another fraud, another way of putting God in the role of lying and using Satan's weapons. Using the weapon of death, it's, it's the power of Satan. Using the weapon of deceit and trickery, that's the weapon of Satan. And this is what you get. You get, and this is, again, the man of sin setting himself up in God's temple such that religious people are worshiping a God that practice the attributes of Satan. Let's continue on with these okay. these contrasts between what the wicked experienced at the end and Christ on the cross. Did somebody yeah. say something? Yeah, yes. Lisa had a question. I was just yeah. wondering, when we die, our soul goes to Jesus in heaven, correct? Is that right? So that's what the Bible teaches, the, that our, our individualities are safe and secure in the Lamb's Book of Life, 
And Paul says it's in Thessalonians that when Christ returns, he brings with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. And then those same righteous rise from the grave the, the, and, and Christ downloads their individuality into perfected new bodies and they live again at that time. So, so yes, our individuality, our software, our unique person are safe with Christ in heaven. So when Jesus died, did his soul leave him during that 72 hours? You know, that's an interesting question because we don't have any inspired reference on that. His human individuality, where did the individuality character he developed during his human time on earth go? We aren't told. So maybe he just the assumption would be that it was kept safe. He, well, I, we have an Im indication that he surrendered his spirit into the hands of his father. So his father kept his individuality safe for him for those 72 hours or so. That would be the indication. I also think that uh, he said that I lay down my life. No one is taking it from me. So, That's exactly right. So yep. in other words, he's he's got it. <laughs> we we may not okay. have all the all the fill in yet, you know, on the details of that. But it, it nevertheless, it really truly con confirms what you've been saying here about about his death so, being unique. Let's finish this up with these contrasts. Christ died when love overcame selfishness. The wicked die overcome by selfish, selfishness. Do you, do you agree with that point? Yes. Are those the same experiences? No. Are those the same types of death? Nope. So in every indicator in scripture and by comparison, Jesus did not die the second death and he does not die the experience of the wicked in the end. There is one place where they're similar, and this is where people get confused. And they get confused, and they'll confuse more if they don't understand design law, but that is God the Father treats Jesus at the cross and the wicked in the end with the same action from the Father. And that is called in the Bible God's wrath. And God's wrath is when God stops using power and sets people free to reap what they have chosen. And at the cross, God stopped using his sustaining life-giving power and surrendered Jesus free for Jesus to experience what Jesus freely chose to do, which was to go through the cross. Thus, Jesus did experience the wrath of his father, his father's abandonment, his father's letting go because Jesus chose to walk that path. And the wicked in the end also experience God's cessation of using power. And in this case, God's restraining, life-giving, protective, merciful, gracious powers and interventions that have been holding back the winds of strife and the forces of evil, and the principalities of darkness, and all the things that God has been restraining that sin does in mercy, have time for repentance and healing. God ceases using power and sets them free to reap what they have chosen. But they have chosen the opposite of Jesus. They have not chosen love and trust. They have chosen rebellion and hardness of heart. And thus, God's action to pour out his wrath and let go is the same action from the heavenly throne upon both, but they both experience different outcomes because they made different choices in who they actually became as living beings. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and people will confuse this further when they confuse God's wrath with Satan's wrath. And that's because they confuse the different systems of government. Satan's government is the government of made up rules and made up rules like he, all the kingdoms of the earth are like Rome. You have to enforce made up rules with external punishments. And this, thus Satan's wrath is always the wrath of using power to inflict harm upon those who you're wrathful towards. That's Satan's wrath. It's always the same. You're going to be wrathful toward by pouring out power to torture and hurt. God's wrath is the wrath of the creator who ceases using power and surrenders people to reap what they have chosen. And if they have chosen to sever themselves from the source of life and the law of life, then they reap ruin and death. And this is what the Bible teaches in Romans chapter 1, 24, 26, and 28, many other places.
Wow, it's 11 o'clock and I wanted to make a, uh, at least a couple more points. Can I make, can, can we take a minute and do a couple couple other things? Please do. Okay, and this is out of uh, Wednesday's lesson. And in Wednesday's lesson, it reads um, in the uh, last paragraph. Was there a comment? No. Okay. However, a mere repetition of the words of the psalm with only a slight comprehension of their meaning will not produce the authentic transformation intended by their use. When praying the psalms, we should seek the Holy Spirit to enable us to act in the way demanded by the psalm. The psalms are the word of God by which believers' characters and actions are transformed, not simply informed. By God's grace, the promise of the Psalms are made manifest in the lives of believers. This means that we allow God's word to shape us according to the, according to God's will and to unite us with Christ, who demonstrated God's will perfectly uh, and as the incarnate Son of God prayed the Psalms as well. And then, so, have you ever heard pain is fertilizer for the soul? Exactly. Not, exactly. Not exactly in that term. Yeah. Okay. Well, you've heard it today. Pain is what's fertilizer do? It 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 it, it stimulates growth. Yeah. And, and Paul in Romans five three and four writes, "We also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering pr produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope." This is the idea here. Uh, do you believe it's true? Yes. Yeah. And I want you to understand this is biblical wisdom that is counter to the philosophy of this age, the philosophy of the fools of this world. Uh, I recommended a book some time ago, I'll say it again, if you haven't read it, it's called The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure um, by, by two authors who identify themselves as progressive um, um, liberals who don't believe in God, and they're both psychologists, yet, because they are the historic liberals, I should have said not progressive liberals, as liberals, but not the, his, uh, the historic liberals who are people who want liberty and the pursuit of truth without coercion and the, and the traditional principles of freedom of conscience and freedom of speech and freedom of thought. The, the, these liberals who don't believe in God have pursued uh, what they can identify as truths as to what's happening. And they've identified what they've identified as three untruths that have taken root in America today and are being taught across the campuses of America that are destroying the generations, the, the X generation and the Z generation and the I generation. And, and these three untruths, as they talk them, and we would call untruths lies, are, are the following. Here's what they've identified, and they do a great job in pointing this out as how it's being taught philosophically in the media and so forth across. What doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Always trust your feelings. And life is a battle between good people and evil people. And what they document from the great sages of history, Confucius, Buddha, Socrates, Plato, they don't really go to scripture, but the scripture teaches the same truths as, as the great truths because eternal truths are eternal truths regardless of who identifies them, is that the truths are what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. The idea that it's life's challenges, uh, the uh, obstacles that we work through, the pain and difficulties, just as I read to you from Romans just a moment ago, is what helps us develop and, and mature. And so accepting the lie, ha the lie has led to the concepts of avoiding things that are difficult, avoiding trials, avoiding obstacles, avoiding emotionally upset, setting things. So we need safe spaces, places where our ideas won't be challenged, where our concepts won't be exposed as flawed, where words won't upset us. We must remove names from buildings and statues from parks and books from libraries. And if it's in the church, we must remove people and their material that challenge our orthodoxy with evidence and truth that we can't refute. Rather than struggle through the deeper meaning and deeper Bible study, we instead create safe theological spaces where only our ideas are presented and our orthodoxy views and our fundamental beliefs are supported because we, we want a safe space where weak minds won't be challenged to develop. <laughs> and that's what's happening in our church today. Uh, and then always trust your feelings. All the great sages taught that emotions energize us, but are not to be trusted as emotions can lie. And the Bible tells us in James 1 that 
We have, no one should say God tempts because God doesn't tempt anyone. Each one of us are tempted or dragged away and enticed by our own evil desires or feelings. Temptations motivate, they energize, but they cannot be trusted. And thus we should work through our emotions with light of truth and choose that which is true in spite of how it feels. But when you accept this lie, then if something happens that causes you to feel pain, well, then that means you're being assaulted. If somebody speaks words that upset you and hurt your feelings, then they're being aggression. And aggressive words are a form of violence. And it's just right for us to attack back with violent behavior against someone's speech. So we should silence speech that upsets us because that hurts us. And this is what you see with all this craziness happening in our country. And then the other third lie, life is a battle between good people and evil people. This is a lie. All the great sages have always taught that there is a battle between good and evil happening inside human hearts. Not between you. And if you shift this to battles between good people and evil people, then if someone disagrees with your view and challenges your view with words that upset you, then they're evil because you're good. God. And it sets up this great division in society. Wow. Who, who are the authors of that book? <laughs> the author, the book is called The Calling of the American Mind, and the authors are, where did I put those authors' names? Um, Greg Lukanoff and Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, H-A-I-D-T. Very inappropriate. Okay. So any questions about that? So we should be thankful that this wisdom is biblical wisdom. All those three points of truth are found in Scripture, are they not? Yeah. Let's, let's go ahead and, and, close, and close with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you have provided for us biblical eternal truths that we can study and identify with that reveal the truth of who you are and your kingdom, but also expose the, the falsehood of Satan's kingdom, this imperial, legal lie based on fantasy and, and, and falsehood. We pray that you would pour your spirit out, take the victory that you achieved in our behalf, and we are so thankful for what you did, Jesus, because we would never be able to fulfill and accomplish what you accomplished. And we ask for your spirit to pour into our hearts and allow us to become effective in taking this final message of mercy to the world. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. And while I was praying.